Hello, this is Tony Blazer for the Motocross Vault presented by Blinzall. If you're in the market for some high-quality racing oil for your two-stroke or four, make sure you go to blinzall.com and use our discount code VAULT20 to save 20% at checkout. Thank you for all the support. Hello and welcome back to the Motocross Vault. My name is Tony Blazer and what this video is going to cover is one of the most significant and influential machines in all of motocross history, Honda's CR250. Initially introduced in 1973, the CR250M Elsinore, as it was known then, was a game-changing machine at the time. Now Honda was not the first of the Japanese manufacturers to get involved in motocross, actually it was the last. Kawasaki had been the first one to get involved in the mid-60s there. It wasn't a real serious effort, they were kind of just dabbling in it. In the late 60s, Suzuki put both feet in full force and actually ended up winning the world title pretty quickly. Within a couple of years of enter entering the sport, they were world champions. Very impressive for Suzuki, especially considering how much smaller Suzuki was as an entity compared to like a Honda Corporation or some of these others. Their production machines, the TMs in this case, weren't great machines. They were okay. Um, they were certainly okay for a clubman racer or somebody. The TM125 was probably the best one. Uh, the Cyclone, the 400, the open class bike was notoriously vicious, but uh, some of the smaller ones were decent machines. I know they have their following, uh, but really they weren't world class. They weren't really going to dethrone like Mako and CZ as the uh, top machines in the sport. But when it's 1973, when Honda came out with their first two-stroke, the CR250, this was a mind-blowing machine. It was inexpensive. It was reliable. It had high-quality electricals. Uh, things didn't fall off of it. Uh, the performance was very good for the time. Now, it wasn't as cutting edge as some machines that would come up very shortly after it. Uh, but at the time, it really was like the darling of the magazines. Uh, it, went, it ended up winning the 250 national title right out of the box with Gary Jones. Really amazing machine. And uh, kind of set the tone for what would become the Japanese domination of motocross in the 70s. Really, this is the first one uh, that really made a dent in the, the kind of, I guess, the mind share of the, the top machines in motocross. Uh, like I said, I'm sure, you know, Yamaha's DT, MX, and all these machines... They sold a ton of them, but they weren't really considered like upper echelon machines. They were really converted enduro bikes. This uh, CR250 was designed to be a motocrosser, and basically a no compromise motocrosser from the start. Honda had been very hesitant to get into the two strokes. They had focused exclusively on four strokes at this point. Uh, they, I think Mr. Honda thought the two strokes were noisy and smelly and gross in general. <laughs> and the four strokes were, you know, more reliable, pleasant, kind of the image that Honda wanted to portray. But the four strokes at the time, especially in the smaller boards, they had trouble kind of running with the two strokes of similar displacement. This two stroke was, they found out, was the way to go. So they kind of eventually decided this was the, the direction they would take. And in 73, they introduced their first motocross machine, the CR250M Elsinore. Really a game changing machine, as I said, and a really significant machine. Now, Honda would continuously produce this from 1973 until uh, its eventual uh, retirement in 2007. Um, the, my, the machine, unfortunately, went away when the, they went all four-stroke. Kind of went back to their roots, unfortunately. Uh, me, I'm a big two-stroke fan, and uh, I'm sad to see them go. But Honda had a hell of a run. The CR250 was, even though it wasn't always the best bike, it had a lot of the mind share within the sport for many years and was a very significant machine. There's no way, even if you're a Honda hater, you can't discount how influential the Honda CR250 was, for sure. So if you like this sort of thing... You can check out some of the others I've done. I've done a history on the CR CR80 as well, uh, taking it from the, its initial introduction in 1980 until its demise as well, I believe 2007. And I've covered a couple other retrospectives, the XR250, so they're all on the channel. You'll be able to find them if you'd like to see the, um, some more history videos. I've also done some retrospectives on some of my magazines back here. I just did one on Dirt Wheels from 1986. I've done one from uh, uh, Motocross Action. I'll do more of them as it goes. You can see I have quite a, a wealth here. So if you like this sort of thing, make sure you subscribe to the channel, give it a like and a share on social media. I would appreciate it. And if you want to sh uh, help the channel, I have some motocross uh, vault merch. Here's my 1990 CR version. I just came out with one that's based on uh, Jeremy McGrath. I did a uh, 1992 Bradshaw design as well. I really like the design of that. This is one of my favorite years and favorite bikes. So I'll put a link in the description below and a little card up here if you'd like to check it out and support what I do. Because of the sheer size and scope of this subject, I've decided to switch things up a little bit and divide this into two videos. This first one is going to cover the 70s and 80s. The second part is going to cover the 90s and 2000s. So it's going to cover the CR from its introduction in 73 until its demise in 2007, but I, I figured I'd divide it up in half, because otherwise it's going to be like a two-hour video, hour and a half at least. It's going to be pretty long, so I can get pretty uh, talky at times. So anyway, if you want to check out the second part, look for it about a week or so after this one comes up. So... This is going to be the first part. This one's the first part. This one's going to cover the 70s and 80s of the history of Honda CR250R. In the fall of 1972, 
the all-new CR250M Elsinore made its debut. The original machine was named for the Elsinore Grand Prix, which was a very popular race in California at the time. Honda in Japan feared that because their reputation was really not geared towards motocross or off-road racing, uh, that they thought they needed a little kick to get a little more name recognition. So the thought was they would take this very significant race here in California, put it on the Elsinore, put it on the CR, and maybe that would help people identify with the brand a little more. It's funny, if you look at some of the uh, original mock-ups of the bike in Japan, it didn't even have a Honda wing on the tank, it just said Elsinore. So that was kind of the focus of this early machine, which is a very interesting little tidbit there. Now, this first uh, CR came in at $1,145, which was considered a very, very reasonable price at the time, particularly in light of the amount of performance the CR had and the fact that it was very race-ready right out of the crate. It was one of the few machines you wouldn't have to go and break out a hacksaw, replace everything on it before you go to the track. You could buy a CR250, wheel it right into the back of your truck, take it to the track and race, which was pretty unheard of in 1973. Now, this first CR250 used a 248cc piston port two-stroke mill. Now, what that means is there was no kind of an um, intake reed valve on it. Really, the reed valve was one of the first things Yamaha kind of brought to market there. Uh, Kawasaki was using a, their own kind of a, a valve called a rotary valve. Long story short, the reed valve was uh, gave the machine better low in response. It prevented some of the intake charge from like essentially backfiring into the intake. And uh, it was very efficient, and pretty much all two strokes now use that design. But this early version of the CR did not have it. The piston port was a little simpler, easier to produce. Now, this first version, as I said, was very light. Uh, handled well, although some people thought the chassis was a little long and it didn't turn particularly great. Uh, but compared to most of the other machines of the time, it was very, very well regarded. Pretty much its only real knock on it was the original swing arm used nylon bushings in it, and they tended to wear out pretty quickly. They weren't very, uh, very durable, but for the most part, this bike was very durable for its time. Of course, compared to a modern machine, it would be, you know, not that well put together, but in 1973, the CR was by far the best built machine you could buy in the 250 class. Now, this first one, as I said, was really mind-blowing to people used to having to go to Europe to buy a Husqvarna or a Mako or something else to get that kind of level of performance. So Japanese, basically, they brought the same level of performance as many of the European rivals, less costly, more reliable, better built. It really was an important machine in 1973. Now, in 1974... The CR250 was back with no changes, literally no changes. Didn't change the looks, didn't change anything on the bike. The bike was a huge success, and Honda sold every one they could build. And I guess, obviously, after several years of development, they didn't feel like uh, retooling after a single year. So the 74 version is identical. Really, the big deal in 74 was the all-new 125 version, the CR125M, which turned out to be even a bigger hit, probably, than the CR250 and really maybe is the single most important machine in motocross history in terms of its impact on the sport. That uh, 125 made it quite quite big waves in 1974, but the 250 side really pretty much stayed unchanged. After offering a retread model in 1974, Honda dialed up some pretty significant changes to the CR250 for 1975. They rebadged it the CR250M1, and this new 75 model moved the rear shocks forward and offered an inch more travel than the 1974 Elsinore. A new quote-unquote up pipe was also spec'd and mounted to a redesigned frame that moved the motor forward and down slightly. Visually, the biggest change is the new red accents, which replaced the green of 1973 and 74, and they added white plastic fenders that supplanted the silver units found on the first-generation machine. In the motor department, the new M1 retained the 248cc piston port design and close ratio 5-speed transmission of the first-generation Elsinore. While these changes were significant, they were already falling behind the competition. The piston port motor that was so lauded in 73 was not nearly as responsive as the reed valve unit found on the Yamahas. Likewise, the CR's rear dampers, while an improvement, were no match for the long-travel monoshock found on the Yamaha MX and YZ models. The new up pipe did aid ground clearance, but the pipe's bend and head changes for 1975 actually yielded less power than the old motor. The motor was fast when it was on the pipe, but it was difficult to keep it there. Overall, the new Elsinore was an improved machine, but it was no longer the star of the class it had been when it was introduced two years before. By 1975, the Yamaha YZ250 had supplanted it as the dominant machine in the class. For 1976, the big news on both the CR250 and CR125 was the bike's bold new look. All new red bodywork and red frames closely mimicked the appearance of Marty Smith's and Pierre Carsmaker's factory bikes and made the machines look far newer than they actually were. Both bikes carried over with minor motor changes, and in the case of the 250, no real suspension upgrades for 76. 
There was also much more competition for 76, as Suzuki chose to introduce their all-new RM250 this year. Now, this bike featured long travel, laid down shocks, cutting edge handling and suspension. It was a really, really significant machine for Suzuki and by far their most competitive motocrosser up to this point. Now, compared to the new Suzuki, the Elsinore offered two inches less suspension travel. So that was a huge disadvantage for the Honda. On the track, the CR250 suffered from outdated technology in 76. Its lack of suspension travel and poorly damped shocks pounded riders from the get-go, and they only got worse as the shocks heated up and the damping went away. Fade was a major issue in these early uh, Elsinores. The new frame proved fairly stout, but the swing arm was made of steel and it tended to flex under heavy use. The old-fashioned piston port motor provided a decent peak output, but it continued to lack the response and broad power output of some of the competition. The CRs were pretty, but they were far less effective on the track than their high-tech competitors. In 1976, motocross technology was moving at Quasar speed, and unfortunately Honda had their machine stuck in neutral. Because of slowed sales, Honda chose to not even introduce a 77 CR250. There were a ton of the 76s still stuck on showrooms all over the country, and Honda chose just to stand pat and let them clear out the leftover models before introducing an all-new, completely redesigned machine for 1978. Now, in 78, they finally did unleash the full arsenal of their impressive engineering department on the 250 class. The all-new from ground up CR250R Elsinore was completely redesigned and a radical departure from the outgoing machine. Even the name was new, as the machine dropped the M designation of earlier CRs and replaced it with the new R designation to denote its status as a true works replica. Featuring nearly a foot of travel front and rear, the 78 towered over its short-legged predecessors. The new motor was incredibly compact, featuring lightweight magnesium cases that were shrink-wrapped around the internals. The new motor was painted the bright red of their works bikes and even featured the Euro-style left-hand Kickstarter of Brad Lackey's RC500. Inside the motor, there was a work-style six-pedal reed valve, which was a first for Honda, a chrome bore, and a very trick adjustable external ignition. Now on the track, the new CR250 was an absolute rocket and proved Honda could once again build a competitive 250 machine. It pumped out a hard-hitting and expert-oriented style of power that came on strong and just kept pulling. There was very little torque off idle, and the bike was a handful for novices, but nothing in 1978 was as fast as the Red Rocket. The new 37mm shower forks and twin shocks pumped out the most travel in the class, but the action was less than impressive. The stock steel swing arm also was fairly prone to flexing, and most serious racers opt to replace its grim shocks with some kind of aftermarket or alternatives. After several years of neglect in the 250 class, the 78CR250R was the most important model Honda had released since its introduction. It revitalized interest in the brand and showed that Big Red was going to do more than sit back and rest on its laurels while its competition innovated. It was blazing fast, cutting edge, and positively dripping with works bike swagger. It was just what Honda needed to get back in the game and proved a very, very significant machine for the brand. For 1979, the CR250R was back with fairly minor updates. The basic machine, as I said, was only the year before, so really it was refinement was the name of the game in 79. The cylinder had some new porting. It also got a new reed valve, which was designed to give it better low-end response. They changed the valving and the forks and the shocks slightly, uh, but really it was mostly just minor tweaks to try and get a little better performance out of the machine. Now, it did offer better low-end response. Like as I said, the 78 was very powerful, but it did not have a lot of grunt, and when it hit in the mid-range, it hit, like, really hard. Uh, my first motocross machine was a 78 CR250, and I can tell you that thing was a rocket ship. It was really fast and hard to ride for me because I was uh, young and didn't know what I was doing. So it was pretty pretty dicey at times. Now, the 79 model did get the new Claw Action Tire, which was a Honda design tire. I believe Bridgestone made them. Uh, kind of a unique design. They put them on all their motocross and off-road machines in 79. They're pretty not loved in general. I don't think many people were big fans of the Claw Action Meets. Although the 79 250 did not get the Slightly strange 23-inch front wheel that the, the 125 got this year. In 79, the 125 got the R treatment. This is the first year for uh, the all-new 125 R Elsinore in the 125 class. And uh, it got a 23-inch wheel, which was also on the XRs. And that was done for many reasons. They thought it would track better in uh, certain conditions and what have you. But some people thought the front end had a little different, kind of a weird feel with that 23-inch wheel. And also limited your tire selection quite a bit because you got to figure everybody else was using a 21. So... Um, they, needless to say, the 23 did not catch on. 
Uh, but the, the 250 did not get it in this year in 1979. So basically the 79 is very similar to the 78, just with similarly bad suspension. The suspension wasn't any better, uh, and the motor's performance is a little better. It's a little easier to ride. For 1980, the CR250R was back with an all-new look. Now this basic design is similar to the 78, 79, but you'll see uh, the frame was new in, 70, in 1980, has a redesigned motor, the bodywork is largely changed. This is the first year for the FIM mandated rear mounted plates. As you can see, the side panels now have the number plate put back a little bit farther to be easier to read. This was something mandated by the FIM in Europe. And uh, 1980 Honda finally got with the program and put it on their machines. Kawasaki and uh, Yamaha had done it a year before in 79. Now this bike, although I like the side panel design better, I don't really like this move to a plastic tank. This plastic tank, to me at least, is not as attractive as uh, my beloved 78 uh, alloy unit, although I'm sure it was more durable in a crash. The only problem with that aluminum tank was if you dropped it, it was really easy to dent it. And if that happened, that really sucked. <laughs> so this new frame is stronger for 1980. It featured a, a split cradle uh, down the front here, and they moved from a side port exhaust to a center port exhaust to accommodate that. Now, the cylinder was all new, obviously, moving the exhaust port and featured a redesigned reed valve as well. Now, this motor was torquier than the 78 and 79 models, but did not pull as far on top. It's not as fast. Um, I think if you were a little bit slower, it probably was easier to ride, uh, but it definitely lacked that high RPM rush that had really been a favorite of people in 78 and 79. So this motor is slower overall, but maybe a little easier to ride. I think really the main problem was the suspension continued to be pretty poor. They added a set of uh, remote reservoir set of shocks for 1980, but they really didn't work any better than the old ones. Uh, if you were going to go fast on the, in these days, you better get the forks fixed. Maybe go with a Simmons kit or go with some Fox Air shocks in the back or something, and you had a really potent machine. But uh, with the stock suspension, none of these CRs in this era are, are really great performance with the stock stuff installed. 1981 was a huge year for motocross and a huge year for Honda. That year, they made a total revamp of their complete model line, and that brought with it new technology, spacey styling, and their first open class bike, the CR450R. All three CRs featured completely new frames, new motors, and redesigned bodywork. They were boldly styled with cutting edge looks and works technology. For 1981, both the CR125R and CR250R adopted liquid cooling, and this was a pretty big deal at the time. Works bikes have been running liquid cool motors on and off for a few years but no one in 1980 had put them into production. For 1981, Honda, Suzuki, and Yamaha all adopted water cooling on their 125s, but only Honda chose to put the liquid cooling in effect in the 250 class. At the time, it was pretty much accepted that high-strung 125s needed that extra cooling, but many believe the 250s and 500s did not. Unnecessary or not, Honda decided to bring this technology to the 250 in 1981. The other big technological development for 81 was Honda's all-new single-shock rear suspension system. Dubbed the ProLink for its progressive linkage, the new design featured a single shock mounted amidship in front of the airbox and connected to a bell crank linkage mounted below the swing arm. The ProLink was similar in theory to Suzuki's full floater and Kawasaki's Unitrack, but it was completely different in design and execution. In spite of the 250 offering a great deal of technology, its performance on the track turned out to be fairly lackluster. The engine was powerful but pipey and considered pretty hard to ride by most. The 250 was overweight as well, weighing more than many open-class bikes at the time. The clutch was weak, the transmission was fairly fragile, and there were issues with the shock as well. Overall performance was fairly mediocre, and the bike was a big step forward in terms of technology, but in actual performance it was fairly disappointing. After the relative disappointments of 1981, Honda was back with an all-new and all-improved CR250R for 1982. This was the first year that Roger DeCoster got to play a major role in the development of the CRs, and it really showed through in the performance of the machine. The bike was all new from stem to stern, with a redesigned chassis, all new bodywork, and revamped suspension. This was the first year that they went to the 43mm forks on the CR250. In 1981, it had used a 41mm design. Now, these are still damper rod style forks. Cartridge forks are still a few years away. There was an all new ProLink shock in the back that improved performance with revised ratios. The engine was very similar to 1981 in overall design. It still did not have a power valve yet. In 1982, the only 250 available with a power valve was Yamaha. They were the first one to actually put that on their motocrossers. But the CR did provide a very strong low to mid power band that most people liked much better than 1981. 
The new suspension worked better. The bike handled much better. The chassis was a little tighter in terms of geometry, and the new bodywork gave it a lighter feel. The radiators were lowered for 1982. The overall bike was pretty much improved in every category. Now, it wasn't quite the best machine in motocross in 82. The RM250 was pretty much acknowledged as the best 250 in that year. It uh, did not have the plush full floater suspension like the RM did. But the bike was way more competitive than it was in 81 when it was pretty much the, the tail end of the field. So this 82 bike, maybe across the line, actually, as far as all the machines in 82, Honda made a huge stride from 81. The 81 really pushed the envelope in terms of technology, but didn't really hit the mark in terms of performance. 82, they refined all those things, kind of fine-tuned how they work, and the machines turned out to be much better on the track. 1983 turned out to be another huge watershed year for Honda. Amazingly. For the third year in a row, they completely redesigned their 250 motocrosser. The 83 CR250 was all new. You'll notice the styling is much different. This is by far my favorite in terms of color combos. I love this 80s uh, look here. The flash orange, kind of flash red color they called it, which is more of an orangey red. Uh, this mimicked the 82 works bikes, the blue seat. Just love this look. I've owned two 83s. Both of them are 480s, though. I've never had the 250. Although my uh, my brother-in-law had a 125 when we were in high school, and I oh god, I just drooled over that machine. I just, still to this day, this is considered one of the best motorcycles of the early 80s. Phenomenal uh, bike this year. It won most of the shootouts, basically because it was a great all-around machine. There wasn't anything that was like holy crap standout. It had a really great uh, broad engine, uh, workmanlike chassis, very good tight handling, very light. Um, it's funny, like when you look at one of these 83s, it's amazing how advanced they were for the time. And you take it apart, it's not that different than a bike 10 years later would be. This bike had a fully removable rear subframe, something that many of the competition wouldn't get until the early 90s. Kickstarter's aluminum, uh, the shifter's aluminum, the brake's aluminum. The bike was super light, as I said. For the time particularly, even today, it would be considered a very light motorcycle. Nice ergonomics. Uh, just a really, really excellent motorcycle. And a, a, one of the best motorcycles for Honda in the early 80s, for sure. 83 was pretty much phenomenal across the board. The 125 was very good in 83. And the 480 uh, really kicked butt that year. Like I said, I've had two of them. Phenomenal machine. Very fast. Uh, a great bike in 1983. A bike that people still love to this day. And uh, like I said, Honda really, they really hit it out of the park this year. They, um... Got everything pretty much right, and this was a uh, really, really awesome year to be riding red. For 1984, Honda was back with another all-new CR250R. Now, this is crazy to think about today when you see how budgets have shrunk and manufacturers hang on to the bike for four, five, ten years if you're on a Suzuki without any major redesigns. Here, Honda had completely redid the motor, completely redid the suspension, chassis, everything, four years in a row. Just amazing. Um, now, this 84 model is the first one to get a front disc brake. Huge improvement. That's the one thing I had on my 83 that was sketchy as hell was that drum was uh, not up to stopping that massive power the 480 made. So this is a big improvement for 1984. This is the first year of the ATAC, which is the automatic torque amplification chamber on the CR250 and CR125. Actually, I think the CR80 even had it this year. Um, that was a resonance chamber that uh, basically tricked the motor into thinking you had a torque pipe installed at low RPMs and then a rev pipe at high RPMs. Some years worked better than others, but in 84 here, this, this worked phenomenally. The CR250 was by far the fastest 250 that year. It was a rocket. It uh, was way more powerful than 83, which was a great all-around engine, but not particularly fast. It was, like I said, the 83 was a great do-it-all machine, but it didn't wow you in any one category. But in 84, Honda just owned the 250 class in terms of performance, uh, motor-wise anyway. The suspension was still mediocre. Again, Honda at this point had, had really had yet to perform um, any great works of uh, excellence in the suspension category since they came out in 1973. None of the CR250s up to this point were great in that category, but it was decent enough to be competitive, and the motor made up for a lot. Bike handled very well. These CRs turned on a dime. They had some pretty sketchy head shake, but overall, most people were fine with that. You know, for Supercross-style obstacles and stuff, clearly the tight turning chassis was ideal. Now, this bike is one of my favorites in terms of styling. Um, I love the looks of it. It's a great-looking motorcycle. Even today, I think the, the looks hold up excellently. Again, love that orange, love the blue seat. Great-looking motorcycle. Really, the only beef with the 84s was reliability. There were a lot of problems with uh, the pistons breaking on them. They were very unreliable. Um, there was issues where the, I guess, I think the exhaust bridge wasn't sufficient to give the piston support, and it cracked the piston. So, 
That's something they addressed in 85, but this 84 model was fast but unreliable. So that's kind of a black market. You know, if you're looking to buy one now, um, you got to watch out for that. But other than that, this was an excellent year for Honda and a really, really, really good looking machine. For 1985, the CR250R was back with yet another complete redesign. Now that again absolutely blows my mind. You think about this, from 1980 until 1985, Honda completely revamped their bike every year. That meant new frames, new bodywork, new motors. It's just amazing. And this 85 design is a clean sheet redo, and it is a beautiful motorcycle. This is by far my favorite year for Honda in terms of styling. I love the color combos, and this 85, uh, 86 bodywork is, in my opinion at least, maybe the best Honda ever did. It was just a gorgeous motorcycle. Now, a lot of the changes in 85 were geared towards addressing the woeful reliability of the 84. As I said, the 84 was a great machine in terms of performance. One, I believe all the shootouts in 84, but the problems were many as far as reliability. There were issues with the, the main bearings and the uh, crank failing, pistons cracking, a litany of issues that kind of put a black mark on the bike that year. Now, for 85, they changed the plastic separators on the main bearing to metal to hopefully make them more reliable. They added a bridge to the exhaust port to stop the skirts from cracking. Uh, they did a lot of things. They redesigned, of course, the porting. The ATAC system was massaged. Now, this is the last year for the ATAC in the 250. Uh, the 125 would continue using it until, I think, 1989 was the last year on the 125. But this year would be the, the last year on the 250. Now, in terms of performance... Uh, the 85 turned out to be pretty disappointing compared to the 84. The engine was a tractor. It was a really strong low-end motor, uh, but not any top end at all. The bike was, quite frankly, slow. It was a great novice motor. I almost bought one of these. It had really good grunt, and it was fun to ride, you know, if you weren't going to, you know, be a top-level motocrosser. I'm sure at my speed back then, I, I didn't care. I thought it was fun because it was torquey. And again, I, a lot of the riding I did was in the woods. So for that kind of stuff, it was good. But for outright performance, motocross, you know, quote-unquote, it was a little bit slow that year. Not maybe the best motor for that. Suspension wasn't phenomenal either. Uh, this still this is the last year for the regular damper rod style forks, and they were mediocre. Uh, two of my friends actually both had 85 125s this year, and uh, the shock also went away. The shock was not, um, I don't believe this shock body was hard anonized, and they just had issues with reliability. They'd wear out, and then the shock would go away. Overall, you know, the bike had really great ergonomics. It turned very well. As I said, it was beautiful. But in the overall standings, this bike was not anywhere close to the best machine in 1985. If you had a styling contest, I think it would have won, but in terms of track performance, it was fairly disappointing. 1986 marked the beginning of the production rule in America, and that meant that the factory team had to actually race production-based motorcycles, something that Honda had not been doing. Famously, they'd been running complete works bikes, which shared absolutely nothing with the stock machine. So I think they knew they needed to really up their game, and they came to play in 1986, because the CR250 was by far the best machine. I mean, it was like... Uh, so much head and shoulders better than everything else, it's not even funny. And this mainly was due to the all-new engine. Uh, in 1986, they retired that original ATAC system in favor of the new Honda Power Port system, which basically was a variable exhaust port design, similar in theory to what Yamaha had been using. Now, uh, the KIPP system, which was Kawasaki's uh, power valve system, used both the adjustable uh, variable exhaust port, which was what the Honda Power Port was, and the resonance chamber, which is what the ATAC was. Uh, but at this point, Honda had used one system or another. They hadn't, really, they didn't really integrate those two systems until 1992. So this first one here has just a variable exhaust port, has a set of sliding guillotine valves that slide in and out to cover or uncover the exhaust port to vary the port timing. Now, this system was incredibly effective. It worked awesomely, although it was a complete nightmare to, to work on. Performance-wise, it was phenomenal. This engine, if you've ever ridden one, is super electric, incredibly broad. And you have to keep in mind, and there was, particularly in the early days of two-strokes, it was difficult to get a motor that pulled low, mid, and top. You know, you could get an engine that was really strong, like the 85, for instance, which was a low-end grunter, uh, but had no power on top. Or you had the 84, which was soft down low, but screamed on top. You kind of got one or the other. And this 86 motor was this engine that pulled from the first crack of the throttle all the way through the power band. It was just really electric. There was no real churning massive hit or anything. It was just a really easy engine that made power everywhere and just kept pulling and pulling. And it was the best engine of 1986. Uh, the Kawasaki came close with a really strong low end, but no top end. But the, the 86 was great because it was flexible enough to be great for like a novice. Uh, somebody at my speed loved it. This is a phenomenal engine this year. Now, as I said, the body works the same. 
Uh, they made some suspension changes in the rear, not really huge. They changed the ratio ever so slightly from 85. It was all new in 85. But the real news was up front. They went to a cartridge-style damping system, which was something the Works bikes had been using since the actually the mid-70s. And what this did was it allowed for a much finer tuning and a larger range of operation, much like, as I was saying with the motor, uh, in, the, in the damper rod styles, you could tune it to work well at like high speed hits or low speed hits, but it was difficult to get a damper rod fork to be able to flow enough oil that if you open it up to handle a certain type of hit, it wouldn't blow through the stroke. And if you tried to d design it to handle another type of hit, then it wouldn't get like a hydraulic lock. Well, these cartridge systems, they allowed for a much wider range of operation and you could fine tune them much better. They also did a better job of preventing aeration, which was um, air frothing of the fluid. So there were a lot of advantages, and this was something that uh, Honda was the first to put into production in 1986, and it really just decimated the competition. Nobody else was even close in terms of fork performance. It was, um, you know, basically like the difference when you went to the fuel injection on a four-stroke. Uh, it really was a game-changing kind of a thing. Now, this 86, really the only issue with it was the shock was not great. Again, Honda had never at this point had a decent shock. It was better than 85, but still not great. Uh, but really, that's the only thing that people didn't like about it. At the time, it was a phenomenal machine. And if you're not buying one now, of course, there were issues where the, the water pump was magnesium and it would corrode. But this wasn't a problem when the bike was new. Uh, overall, this is a phenomenal year for Honda. Really, the entire lineup from 80 to 500 was amazing. Maybe the most dominant line of motorcycles ever entered if you talk about a complete lineup. Honda just killed everybody in 1986. And really, if you weren't riding a CR, you were at an immediate disadvantage. So uh, this is kind of the, the real seminal year where Honda, when I mean, you think of the 80s being a Honda decade, many of those years, the CRs weren't the best bike. Like I said, 85, pretty much mediocre across the board. Um, 83 was great. 84, good in the 250 class. But some of those years were hit and miss. But the late 80s, Honda really kicked butt. And I think the advantage seems so so much in 1986 that it seemed like maybe people think of Honda dominating maybe more than they did. But in general, this bike was so good that that's uh, kind of started people's thinking that Honda was, you know, owning the whole decade. And I think this machine, there's a good reason it's so popular today. And it's not just Rick Johnson. It was a phenomenal machine. It's a great bike, great looking bike, and an amazing motorcycle. Stop me if you've heard this before, but for 1987, Honda was back with another all new CR250R. Now, this bike uses the same motor design, having introduced the HPP the year before. Of course, they weren't going to scrap it after one year, although Honda had done that before. But in this case, the engine was so good, they kept it. So really, for 87, there was some uh, new porting, and they changed some of the internal settings a little bit to give it a little different power. The 86, as I said, had been very electric, had a very broad power. And for 87, they went to a more mid and up style power, maybe to make guys like Rick Johnson happy, I'm not sure. The engine was faster, but harder to ride. So obviously, if you're a little bit slower, maybe the 87 wasn't as awesome for you, but fast guys love the 87. It was a really strong mid and up power band and a really strong performer. Now, the chassis was completely redesigned for 87. You have an all new Pro Link in the back, new swing arm design, still not the greatest in terms of performance. Now, this is the first year they went away from like a fully remote reservoir, essentially a reservoir that was connected to the shock by a tube. This one used a what they call a piggyback design, where the actual the canister was mounted to the top of the shock in a very strange design that put it right basically at the base of the airbox. Now the problem with this was they put the reservoir up in the bodywork, pretty much like the original monoshock Yamahas, where they had had issues with getting enough air to, to cool the shock. And 87 had the same issue. This 87 design was not very well damped to begin with. The settings weren't great, and uh, the shock would overheat and fade. So that really was kind of the main complaint with this bike. Other than the shock, though, phenomenal motorcycle. Everybody loved everything else. This is the first year they went to the rear disc brake. A big improvement in terms of braking performance. And I know from having uh, many of these motorcycles, I had an 87. Um, I had an actually an 87 Kawasaki and an 87 Honda. And uh, the brake on the Honda was by far the most progressive. Some of these early disc systems and like the Yamahas and the Kawasaki's were very grabby. Had kind of a light switch engagement. They had w plenty of power. Uh, way more power than you actually would need. But they uh, tended to be, like, as I said, a light switch. And it was really easy to stall the motor. And Honda did a good job of giving you that power with these brakes without making it grabby. So you didn't have that sudden engagement that you would cause to you know, stall the engine real easily. Really a really nice implementation of the rear disc brake in 87. Now, this new CR also got the two-piece clutch cover this year. 
So the clutch was beefed up for 87 on the L side of the cover, so you could now service it without taking the whole side of the motor off, which sucked in the old days. You'd have to drain the coolant and everything to change the clutch. So for 87, that was added to the uh, 250. Very, very nice convenience feature and something a lot of the competition did not have. In fact, I don't think Suzuki got that until like 1990. Uh, so Honda was ahead of the game there. Great styling. The bodywork is new. As you can see, the front rear fenders are the same, but the side plates are new. I love this design. Uh, the tank had a little more of a low boy design. The, the saddle went up the all the way up to the gas cap almost. Uh, if you sit on this bike now, it's not particularly thin in the way you'd think of some of the later machines. Uh, but it was, you know, people liked it at the time. I thought it was great. I think it's a great looking motorcycle. And uh, in terms of performance, it was still, in spite of the fact that the shock was mediocre, it was ranked the best 250 in 1987, pretty much across the board. Another year and another all new CR250. Now this machine looks much different. You can tell just from the outside that it is completely redesigned because this is the first year for the ultra slim, quote unquote, low boy layout. This moved the shock body to the side of the shock. This is the first year for the milk bottle type shock reservoir that we see pretty much commonly used everybody uses now. Uh, this also moved the tank and the exhaust pipe much lower in the chassis to improve handling. You know, the whole key is mass centralization. So you want to get the heavy parts down low and towards the center of the motorcycle. And uh, this was the first year where they went with that design. Now, if you've never sat on one of these motorcycles, they are really thin. I mean, razor thin. Uh, they feel very, very slim, even by modern standards. I remember I had my uh, 1990, like two years ago, and I'd get off that and get on my, my brand new KTM 250 four-stroke, and like the, the CR was thinner. I was surprised. And uh, these bikes were really thin. I love that about them. You could slide all the way up on the tank. I love the styling. Great looking motorcycles. Now, at the time, I wasn't super psyched for this change to the blood red. I love, again, the orange and the blue look. Really, that's my favorite combo, I think. But this blood red has really grown on me now. They, you know, they went away to uh, pretty much a monochromatic look. You have, Everything is red or silver. Like, they took the paint off the cylinders this year. Now, this suspension is all new. The rear shock went to an all-new design they call the Delta Link. Now, this design was uh, basically made to work a little better in big hits, stadium whoops, and what have you. And it was clearly designed for more aggressive riding. At slower speeds, it didn't work as well. And they had reliability issues with the, the linkage bolts breaking. It pretty much, it was, if you rode the bike hard, you were going to uh, bend those bolts. Uh, it was a real big problem, pretty much across the board in 88. The motor is the same basic design as 1987. It still uses the Honda power port, but they made a lot of internal changes to the porting to try and make the bike, I think, give it more of that longer pull that the 86 had had. But by most accounts, you know, most people did not like it as well. The engine did have the same long pull. It was super smooth, but it felt slower. Uh, it didn't have the hit that the 87 had, and it was like a classic electric style of power, but the motor felt, you know, slow to the seat of your pants. So a lot of people didn't care for it. I don't think the bike was actually slow. You know, plenty of guys whole shot on the 88 CR, but it wasn't as fun to ride, and a lot of the magazines kind of nicked it for that. Uh, I do know with a little bit of work, Pro Circuit could turn this thing into an absolute rocket again. So it was really was the same basic engine that had kicked everybody's butt the two previous years, but they really just missed the mark with some of the settings in 88. Uh, pretty much most people didn't care for it that, that much. This overall bike, the forks, which had been the best forks in motocross the previous two years, same thing. The 88 settings were not as well received. Most people did not like them this year. And by this point, everybody else had gone on to offer cartridge design. So Honda no longer had this technological advantage. And uh, their design was a couple years old. The basic design, though, again, very, very effective with the right settings. But in 88, they were... They missed the mark, and most people did not rate it as anywhere near the best forks in motocross. Uh, some tests even rated it as the worst. Uh, most people pretty much considered the uh, Yamaha, I'm not sorry, the uh, Suzuki to have the best forks in 1988. This 88CR, in, even though people now love it for its iconic looks, um, and it was, again, very important machine in terms of styling and, and the design of motorcycles going forward with this low boy design, it broke new ground in a lot of ways, but actual effectiveness on the track, it was probably the most disappointing Honda in two years. I think Honda was slightly surprised by the lackluster response they got in 1988 from most of the magazines. And for 1989, they set out to bring the uh, power back to the CR250. Now, this new 89, again, very similar in terms of looks. Really, the only visual difference is the forks. Uh, this is the first year for the inverted Shawa forks. Pretty much everybody except Kawasaki was going to upside down forks in 1989. This is really the transition year where that started. And this first version of the forks... They were not good. In fact, they were terrible. 
Uh, if you've ever ridden one of these things stock, they're absolutely atrocious. They were so bad, in fact, that Honda actually issued a recall mid-year to try and fix the um, fix the fork performance. They installed all new uh, damper systems in there. I, I don't think even after that they were great. Um, like I said, I, I didn't have this. I've ridden an 89. I didn't have one. A good buddy of mine had an 89. But my 90, very similarly, awful suspension. But this new um, new 89, though, did get some motor mods this year. Uh, they revised the porting. They reduced the compression. They enlarged the power ports. They put on a new pipe. And they also changed fourth and fifth gear uh, to give it a little bit uh, tighter spacing. And this was done to bring the hit back. Because like I said, in 88, the motor was fast, but felt slow. This 89 is not that way. This 89 is an absolute rocket. They brought the power back in spades, and it was once again one of the fastest machines in the class. This thing was just blistering on the track in terms of that. Now, the chassis, even though it looks very similar, is different as well. Uh, they added a new shallower head angle for an 89. They increased the trail. They pulled back the triple clamp slightly, and they changed the bar positioning. They also widened the foot pegs. They lowered the subframe. And the seat is slightly flatter. They raised the midsection to get it, make it a little easier to slide forward. The other one had a little bit of a dip in the middle. So they made a lot of changes. Even though this bike, at first glance, looks very similar, they did change a lot. Uh, now, in terms of performance, the bike was rated much better than 88. Again, all the magazines love the new uh, power characteristics. The bike was ridiculously fast. And it handled awesome in terms of tight handling. If you haven't ridden one of these things... They head shake viciously, <laughs> particularly with the stock suspension, which was not very good. Uh, if you're getting tired, I always had a problem. You know, you get late in a moto and your arms are pumped up and you can't hardly hold on. And then the thing would just uh, head shake bad enough to rip your, your handlebars out of your hands. And that was, uh, you know, brown trouser time if that happened to you. But uh, in terms of turning, the bike was phenomenal. You get really far forward. It felt like literally you know, half the width of the Kawasaki in 89, which was very pudgy. It just had a really slick layout. I love the looks of this bike. I know when I did my um, top 10 Hondas, I, if I remember right, I think I picked this as the best looking Honda of all time. Because I, I love the the overall 88-89 design is beautiful. But this 89, I love the, the graphics this year. The new Honda Wing style is awesome. I love the CR and the seat. I like that better than putting the Honda on there. It's just a great, great looking motorcycle. Uh, really, the only beef people have was with the suspension. Like I said, the forks were... Uh, you know, like I think motocross action called them a pair of Roman catapults. They were just terrible. And the shock, the Delta link was still not great. If you were fast and you could charge hard, hit stuff, you know, full, full tilt boogie, it worked okay. But if you backed off a little bit, uh, the shock would kick you in the butt. It just was, it was designed for somebody probably much, much faster than the average Joe. And it just in general was mediocre at best. Uh, the Kawasaki and the Suzuki were way more plush. So uh, overall, great looking motorcycle, certainly an iconic, and I think a lot of people probably would pick as one of their favorites of all times in terms of styling, uh, but a machine that had some, you know, chinks in its armor that year. Uh, if you did get the suspension fixed, though, it was probably the best 250 of 1989. All right, so that's the end of our first installment of the history of the CR250R. Part two, I'll have up in a few days, and it's going to cover the 90s and 2000s uh, up until the end of the model. Uh, if you like this sort of thing again, like, subscribe, comment. I certainly appreciate all the feedback. Love all the interaction we get on here. And if you can help get the word out for the channel, I'd very much appreciate it. If you do want to support what I do, uh, you can get some Motocross Vault merch. I have this new chicken shirt back there I just got. Uh, I really love that design. One of my favorite motorcycles of all time. And I have some other stuff up on the uh, store right now. The link is in the description below. So until we meet again, this is Tony Blazer. Keep the rubber side down and see you for part two. Peace. <laughs>